This episode of Outlander Cast is brought to you by Lola. For 40% off all subscriptions, visit mylola.com and enter Outlander Cast when you subscribe. All the way from Providence, Rhode Island, welcome to Outlander Cast. It's a podcast dedicated to the show Outlander on Stars. Everybody, how's it going? My name is Mary Larson. My name is Blake, and I know this is going to sound a little Outlander fanboyish. I okay, know, okay. I know, but I am so freaking happy. We've spoken to Diana Gabaldon twice in like a calendar four or five months, whatever it is. I know. Like, wh- how did this happen? You know, I'm just so thankful. Like, she's just, obviously, she's the creator of this universe. So, for us to have been, as you said, Outlander fans for all of these seasons, and now... And you even longer. I mean, you're I know, read, exactly. reading as the a books, book reader, you know? It's, um, it's been quite a joy. We're just so thankful for you listening right now with your earbuds in that you're able to share this along with us. So before we get into the interview, we wanted to make sure that if you're new, that you know that you can actually subscribe to this podcast. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, all by searching the title Outlander Cast. And you can also become an official member of the Outlander Cast clan at outlandercastclan.com. There you can get great benefits and extras this season like extra off-air podcast access, access to giveaways, free swag, and much more. And also our newly minted, soon-to-be Hamilton podcast. Yes, that is for our OutlanderCastClan.com members. I'm very excited about that. But we are not here to talk about uh, Hamilton. We are actually here to talk to someone who is very important, much more important than me, (laughs) much more important than this podcast, It's the author of all things Outlander. Mary, are you ready to get into this really actually fantastic interview? It was was very laid back. It was a lot of fun. I, I I had a great time chatting with Diana. Like I know that we're here in our studio and I know that we're we we chat we just chatted with her. But please do know that we speak for you guys. This is what it all comes down to. We're here from you we talk to you guys to try to get all these questions and and so thank you for those of you who helped us uh we did get to reach out to some of you especially our friends at outlandercastclan.com thank you thank you for your help for all this and you ready to get to it dive in yes let's do it Joining us today is a woman who needs no introduction. She just happens to be the author of one of the most read series in history, which has exhilarated millions of people, brought global awareness to Scotland's rich history and culture, and single-handedly inspired the most popular television show on stars. Ladies and gents, Sassanox and Outlander fanatics alike, we present to you the author of the Outlander series, Diana Gabaldon. Diana, Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on OutlanderCast today. Yeah, nice to talk to both of you. Well, first we want to say a huge congratulations on a fantastic adaptation of Gems of Autumn, making it, of course, to the small screen. So congrats again. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. You're welcome. So, of course, the big question is, what kind of prep have you been doing for Season 5, The Fiery Cross? Ah, well, let's see. I have not been doing any personal prep as yet. Uh, luckily, I'm not uh, not obliged to do that. Uh, the prep preseason mostly involves um, um, what they call tech recce or technical reconnaissance, and that happens after they have broken the script, but before they've actually written all of it. Uh, they The location team goes out and finds locations for where they think they're going to need to film this, that, or the other uh, episode. 
And uh, then once they have decided on their locations, they take out a huge busload of all of the crew chiefs and uh, production assistants and uh, the, pr- the producer. We have a new producer for this season. David Brown has left us, alas, and I have not yet met the new person. So, but I'm sure they will be good. And uh, see, and uh, the writers can go along with uh, the writers of whatever block it is can go along as well if they want to. They told me I didn't need to do it when I wrote an episode for season two. I said, "Oh no, I want to see everything," and I was glad I went. It really makes for a really long day because what you do is you arrive at the location, you walk into the place, all sixty of you, and uh, the uh, AD, the assistant director, whips out his script and starts reading whatever scene it is that is shot in this location. And he says, okay, well, now we're standing in the foyer of Drumland Rig Castle, which is going to be the Duke of Sandringham's uh, residence, Belmont. Okay, and this is the scene in which Mary is uh, running and to escape from the evil uh, valet Danton. And so he looks around as this really long room uh, with a door at either end and the front door to the residence in the middle. And he uh, looks at the director and he says, so which door do you want Mary to come in? The director looks back and forth between the doors and he says, well, I don't really care, but I want a fire in that fireplace and points at the fireplace. And three people leap out of the crowd and start measuring the fireplace and figuring out where the gas lines can go under the rug and looking up the (laughs) chimney to be sure it's not blocked because all of the fires that we use uh, are uh, propane because that allows them to regulate the height and intensity and, you know, add chemicals if they need to adjust the color or something like that. Nice. And so they would have a portable fire that they would just insert into the fireplace. Though another problem, of course, when you're dealing with historic dwellings is that some of them are really historic, as in you're not allowed to use fire in them. <laughs> and I've been on more than one location where the assistant director was going around hissing at people, don't mention the word fire. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, the lighting people, this is, you know, the first first thing they mention, because that's one of the sources of their light, and they're concerned about where it's coming from and what the tone is and things like that. Anyway, it's uh, totally fascinating to see exactly what all of the people on a crew do, and being on a technical recce is one of the best ways of learning that uh, shorthand. Yeah. So uh, that was totally fascinating when I did it. I would love to do it again, but at the moment, you know, they're not at that point, and neither am I. As far as I know, they are still in the final stages of breaking script, which means going through the book and deciding what can we have, what can we not have, what can we dispense with, what can we change, you know, to uh, to bridge this gap. How can we possibly take this iconic scene that we know everybody wants to use when we can't use any of the scenes around it for various reasons? So can we change this in some way and shove it in here instead? So all of that stuff. Uh, I'm not not involved in for the most part. Every once in a while, I would sit in on a writer's uh, room session, but uh, not at the moment. So without giving away any big spoilers, because once again, Blake is not a book reader. Is there anything in particular that you are looking forward to seeing adapted in season five that you can tease, of course, for the book reader friends who will understand it like myself? (laughs) Yes. Well, there's a couple of things. Of course, the big thing is what happens to Roger in this particular book, which all of the book readers will know instantly what that is. Um, Another thing, though, is uh, a couple of the things that happened to Jamie. Now, Jamie, is uh, dealing with a couple of main issues here. He needs to uh, establish his community, protect his family and his people, you know, build his house, keep things safe. But he also uh, realizes that the revolution is rising up around him. And at some point, he's going to come to a point where he has to declare his loyalty openly. You know, either he is a rebel or he's not. And when he declares is a matter of some concern, because, you know, he doesn't want to declare too soon and be arrested and imprisoned or hanged by the Red Red Coast, by the British government. Remnants of the British government are still there, though it's rapidly being overcome by the revolution. If he doesn't declare soon enough, he risks, you know, being branded as a loyalist, and the rebels who he knows, he knows what they're going to do, and they are very likely to come around and burn him out if he he, uh, is laggardly about it. So he's sort of looking for a way and means, and, you know, trying to choose his, his spot for doing this, all the while realizing that there is no real way of doing it. He's likely to be forced into it at the most inconvenient moment, which, you know, in a way he is. But anyway, that's that's his uh, chief concern at the moment is, you know, keeping everybody safe and deciding at what point to jump that line. So there was this great moment at the end of season four where Jamie looks at the letter and, and notices, oh my God, I have to actually have to go hunt down Murta Fitzgibbons. 
which is a great connective tissue to what's going to be happening, I think, in Season 5, obviously. But before we get to that, I, I would love to know what your favorite moment from the uh, of the adaptation that, that they did for the television show for Season 4 was. Uh, that would have been Jamie meeting Brianna for the first time. Yes. Oh, I think that's so many of the show watcher, you know, whether they're book reader or not, one of their favorite moments and definitely one of the favorite episodes. So I love mm-hmm. it. What, what, mm-hmm. what part of it, uh, of that meeting, do you think they really captured the essence of? Well, you know, seeing each other for the first time, but you know, then the, that entire episode is concerned with their, with their, you know, slow motion meeting, you might say, mm-hmm. you know, sort of being, after this first, you know, you know, joyous, intense moment, oh my God, you're really there, then you have to realize that you're actually hugging a total stranger. <laughs> and, but how are you going to uh, adapt, you know, what do you need to know about each other going onward? And they explore that very delicately through the rest of the episode. I thought that was really well done. Um, they took the initial meeting scene from the book, which is fairly long, and they broke it basically into three pieces, which they then kind of performed separately through the episode. And I thought it was very effective what they did. I agree. Now, mind you, I also loved episode 406, which involved Jamie and William and Claire and uh, and Lord John. Those were two really nicely organized uh, parallel streams. So great. Is there a uh, one part that you wish could have been inside this season that was in the book that just couldn't be in? Oh, I'm sure there's lots of them if I went back and looked. But, you know, I don't keep score, or I try yeah. not to. Um, you know, every once in a while I'll think, oh, my God, why didn't you do that? <laughs> or sometimes they will do something, and I'll be thinking, no, why didn't you listen to me when I told you this was important? <laughs> why did you do it your way <laughs> and not the way that everyone was expecting to see it? But, uh, you know, uh, the people writing are artists and writers in their own uh, right, and they have a right to, you know, put their own stamp on it. This doesn't mean that, you know, the hardcore book readers are going to be pleased about it, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, the people who are show only will probably be fine with it. Speaking of that, Murta, you know, he's had this huge ripple effect because of his character being in the book and altering plot lines. Some people love it and some people feel like it's taken moments and special times away from the characters that we wanted some more time with. So what kind of effect mm-hmm. would you say that keeping Murta alive in this season and now going forward is having on the story? Ah, well, in fact, I'm rather pleased that they did listen to me when uh, uh, when it came to Murtaugh, because what I said to them, I, I mean, it's fairly early on that they were, in fact, not going to kill Murtaugh, but would keep him alive. I mean, we've known that, obviously, since season three, mm-hmm. because, you know, why would they handle his disappearance in that way? Uh, I mean, they kept him alive through season three, and he shouldn't have been. But I said, you know, since you do have Murtaugh going through season four and so forth, there are a couple of things, you know, that you might do with him, Mm -hmm. because my concern was to keep him from interfering with any of the plot lines that, you know, important. So I was trying to think, how could he be used more usefully and keep him out of the other stuff? So I said, why don't you uh, maybe make him be involved with the regulators? I said, it's really, really hard to explain the war of the regulation to people who were not involved in it or are not historians and so forth. And uh, and you should read, you should have seen some of the earlier scripts about it. <laughs> Just verify that. But I said, if you involve him with the regulation, he can explain it to Jamie in a way that will make it clearer to the viewers without us having to go into a lot of other stuff. Because otherwise, you've got no way of explaining it. You know, uh, uh, we have we haven't got Roger on board as yet. He's the only historian who could have explained it from that perspective, and obviously he's not going to. None of the other people here know anything about it. Most Americans don't know anything about it. That was, in fact, kind of a dress rehearsal for the American Revolution, mm-hmm. in that it was a taxpayer rebellion, essentially. Now, the first uh, scripts that I was seeing and so forth, they were uh, casting it as... Uh, I don't know, class warfare or something like that. They were casting it that, you know, Governor Tryon was uh, trying to drive all of these small settlers off their land in order to collect large parcels of land, which he would then give to his wealthy friends, you know, to gain influence. And this is why they retained me as a consultant, because I (laughs) wrote back and I said, He's the governor. He's just given 10,000 acres to Jamie. Obviously, he's got land to give away. Why would he be taking years and spending the time and trouble to drive off these tiny little people from their land when he could just hand over some of these large chunks to his wealthy friends if that's what he wanted to do? Mm -hmm. And I said, furthermore, you know, there's, uh, I mean, he's the governor. (laughs) You know, he doesn't have to do stuff like that. 
uh, and and uh, they also you know had decided to let's put in a you know, extra helping of outrage over slavery. He wants to give it to his wealthy friends who are going to have plantations full of slaves. I'm going no, this is the back country of North Carolina. Uh, they didn't have plantations because none of the land is suitable for that. I said, furthermore, his wealthy friends, who undoubtedly already own all of the good plantation land near the coast and in the Piedmont, uh, they have their own slaves. They wouldn't be you know, buying more mm-hmm. and so forth. And I said, you know, look, the regulation was so not about slavery. I said it was about taxes, pure and simple. And that was it. The tax collectors were extorting you know, actually illegal taxes, you know, causing pe- forcing people to, to pay their hard-earned cash, which was very scarce, you know, in order to pay taxes that really didn't exist. The tax collector would just show up at your house and say, oh, you owe, you know, me thir- you owe me 13 shillings for the governor's tax. And the house owner would say, what do you mean? It was only five shillings last year. And he'd say, well, it's gone up, hasn't it? Whereas it hadn't, you know, it was still five shillings, but the tax collector would take the extra eight for himself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the tax collector is not the taxpayers not being dummies got onto this fairly soon and objected to it but you know how are they going to resist well what they did was to band together and that's why it's called the regulation they wanted the governor to regulate these tax collectors and prevent them from charging more tax than they were actually allowed to collect well this is a very difficult thing to do if all your tax collectors are scattered around over the back country there's no licensing board there's nobody uh, in keeping them accountable the governor really can't do that <laughs> much to his chagrin and so that's what the War of the Regulation was about. Mm-hmm. So I said, you know, if you insert Murtaugh into this, he can explain it as a taxpayer rebellion, which is what it was. And, you know, slavery and the, and the plantation and the you know, class stuff out of it because that really wasn't an issue. And they did. I mean, they, uh, they adapted it very well in accordance with, you know, with history. And uh, I thought it flowed fairly well. When we last chatted, you said to us that you sent the writers a note uh, that prevented them from doing very, very, very stupid <laughs> <Something> very <laughs> at the stupid. end. Uh, and, and, and just to confirm, I, I just want to confirm if, if I could ask you, is that what they were thinking about leaving the season on the cliffhanger with Brianna asking where Roger was? Uh, no, uh, no, I don't think it was. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure what it was that I prevented them from doing. But I'm not sure how long it was since I talked to you last. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Oh, I know what it was. Yeah, no, it was, uh, mm, no, I'm, 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 no, I really shouldn't tell you about that one. <laughs> it's okay. It's just between us no, girls. It's fine. Stop. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not that one. <laughs> well, well, you know, in in addition to all the, the notes that you have given and, and everything that you helped you know, tried to consult and, and keep everybody kind of on the on the rail line of going the right way. Historically right, yes. Yeah, one, one of the things that I really thought was, was really cool, you know, and it's specific solely to the show, which is the choices of music. I mean, between Hard Rain's mm-hmm. Gonna Fall, America the Beautiful, Batman, Adagio oh, yeah. for mm-hmm. Strings, and others. I mean, the mm-hmm. show has mm-hmm. made some really eclectic choices over the past yeah. couple of seasons. Do, do you have a yes, favorite of these choices so far? Oh, hard rain's gonna fall. I thought that was perfect where they used it, and in the way they used it, it was, uh, you know, just you know, elegantly simple, heartbreaking, poignant, uh, just beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, American, the beautiful. Uh, I didn't mind that choice at all. I thought it was interesting. But, you know, as I said to the people who were wildly divided about it, uh, I said, look, this is what you'd call a bold artistic stroke. You know, it's uh, it's out of the ordinary. It's something that the creator, in this case, uh, Matt, since he wrote that episode, it was his idea. Uh, this was his inspiration, and it's what he wanted to do, you know, knowing full well that it is a bold artistic mm-hmm. stroke. And when you do bold artistic strokes, half the people are going to love it, the other half are going to hate it. I mean, this is just the name of art to be divisive and uh, cause controversy and so forth. And so, you know, I'm, I'm for it in terms of uh, pure art. Well, speaking of Matt, since Matt and Tony have taken on so much more responsibility in terms of show running, are there any major differences between what you've experienced with them as opposed to working with Ron when he was solely focused on the show? Well, yeah, naturally. I mean, a showrunner imprints his or her personality um, on the show as a whole and also on the atmosphere of the writer's room and you know, the conditions under which things run. You know, Ron was working with a smaller, tighter ship. He had uh, four writers, and he himself would write one or two episodes per season. So it was, you know, a fairly tightly knit thing. People knew what each other were doing. Everybody was kind of in each other's business, so to speak. But there was a a fairly united uh, vision, you might say. 
uh, when Ron stepped back, as he as he puts it, uh, they got a lot more writers. They had ten writers uh, for the last uh, couple of seasons, and if you have that many people. That uh, it isn't a bad thing necessarily, but it does mean that each writer has his or her own specific vision, their specific take on these characters. Now, mind you, the writer is not entirely in control of how the characters are presented. Both the director and the actors who portray those characters also have considerable input, um, as do the producers, the showrunners. Uh, so it's it's not a, a singular vision, but it is a vision that be, originates with the writer, and therefore those are going to vary from uh, from episode to episode. So you may get a sort of a a slightly less tightly knit feeling about an episode that's written by that many different people. How often are you talking with Matt and Tony, like either like before the season or during this? Is, is it a, is it a constant conversation on on what's happening? Uh, yes, fairly constant. What happens is that they will send me stuff. They pretty much show me everything that they're doing. So to start with, I would begin getting, uh, and I probably will pretty soon for season five, begin getting script outlines. These are the outlines that they send also to uh, Stars and to Sony for approval before the writer starts actually writing the episode. And so Sony and Stars will both give their input on those outlines, and so will I. So sometimes I will see something in the outline and I'll say, well, you know, you're going to have a problem if you do this because, you know, in the next season, you know, this particular thing happens in that book and uh, you don't want to do this right now because it's going to mess that up and that's fairly important to the view- to the viewer so you maybe want to preserve that and do this a different way you know, things like that or sometimes I'll do something you know that I know is just completely uh, historically inaccurate and I'll say no you know, it really didn't happen this way maybe if this is what you want to do you could do it that way something like that uh, and you know they're not under any obligation to take my suggestions but they, but they do more often than not which I'm very obliged to them for um, likewise they take account of what Sony and Stars are telling them, uh, and that depends on the people who are reading them at Sony and Stars and what they say about it. So there's, uh, it's an immensely collaborative process is the thing. There are at least a dozen voices in every episode, as well as the writer who's writing it. The writer kind of has control of the words, but only to a certain extent. Um, once the script outlines are approved, then they write a production script, which is called the White Draft, and that's the one that they uh, begin shooting reasonably. On the other hand, usually it goes through two or three revisions before they begin shooting. Uh, there's like eight different colors of paper, maybe six. But anyway, every draft goes through four, five, six, seven, eight different drafts in the process of preparation and shooting. And that says different people have input, different people have a problem with this, with that. Uh, there's logistics that say, oh, we can't do that, even though it looks good on paper, it just won't work. Or, oh, we tried this, and the, and the actors just hated it, and it didn't come out well, <laughs> stuff like that. So, you know, it's it's a constantly evolving stream of things, which is fascinating. But they do send me all of the revisions, and I make comments on them. And usually, I try to keep my comments fairly minimal, and only if there's something that I think is important or, or not important important, but, you know, a historical kind of thing, sort of like saying, well, they wouldn't use this word here because, you know, they didn't know that one in the 18th century. But if you are looking for a good picturesque word that they did know in the 18th century, here's three or four, uh, that kind of thing. But other things are, you know, major and organic and so forth. And I'm saying, no, you really don't want to do this. I mean, I see what you're trying to do here, but the reason why you don't want to do this is because it will make the readers assume that this is what you're thinking and you don't want them to think that, <laughs> that kind of thing. So it really I tell them that kind of thing. You know, it's up to them whether they want to take that into account. And if they do, how do they want to address it? So, you know, all I can do is, you know, offer my opinion. And as I say, I'm very lucky that they uh, they pay attention to my opinion. <laughs> you mentioned that Ron had a really tightly knit group. It was only four, four or mm-hmm. five writers or so. That's right. You know, in your position as as the uh, as the mover of this universe, uh, the one that created it all, which did you prefer working with? Did you prefer working with someone of the of the tighter knit group or the one of the larger group that we're now experiencing with Matt and Tony? Uh, frankly, I preferred the smaller group myself, but you know, it's a matter of style and uh, you know individual. Uh, personality, how well you work with this, that, or the other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not the person who's having to work with everybody day by day. So, you know, my preference is strictly an outside perspective. Okay, we're going to take a quick break to talk about our sponsor who helped make this episode happen today. So 
this episode is brought to you by Lola. What is Lola? Well, it's a female founded company offering a line of organic feminine products. It makes your month a little bit easier and our subscription is fully customizable so you can choose your mix of products, mix of absorbency, number of boxes, frequency of delivery, and Lola's subscription is super flexible. You can change, skip, or cancel your subscription at any time. Once again, it's founded by women for women. So, you know, this is such a great, such a great product because they deliver it right to your door. Gone are the days of being like, oh, I need to run to the grocery store. I need to run to the drugstore. I need to send my partner out. It's just there when you need it and very well designed in an incredibly discreet box. It's a super cute little box. And it's just nice because it's personalized to have your variety of needs met. 100% organic cotton, BPA-free applicators that leave you worry-free about what's happening down under. All right? You don't have to worry about that. So I honestly love the convenience of Lola. It's just... I love that I don't have to go to the the drugstore. I know. I'm trying to be so careful. And some of you might be like, Mary, this is kind of different. This is different. Well, I want to tell you what makes this really, really special and why we are so excited to partner with Lola for this episode. You get to do good with your purchase because for every purchase that is made, they donate feminine care products to homeless shelters across the U.S. Once again every purchase they donate to homeless shelters across the U.S. And that is something that is so incredibly needed. And this is why I especially adore this company. So once again, 40% off all subscriptions. Visit mylola.com and enter OutlanderCast when you subscribe. Well, speaking of input, it's actually been recently announced that Sam and Kat are going to be ascending to the role of uh, of some sort of producer on Outlander, the show. What do yes, you... Th- very good. I know, it's very great. And, and I would love to know what you actually think they're going to bring to the table that that's going to add this very important voice to these characters. Uh, well, character is the word there. The reason why they want to be producers and why they should be producers is that gives them an equal voice in what their characters are like. You know, as simply actors, they're pretty much at the mercy of the showrunners, the writers, and the directors. I mean, they can say, you know, I don't think he would do this. I don't, I don't like that scene. I don't want to do that. And, you know, somebody can just say, well, you know, tough. <laughs> you got to do it, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. And that's not good for the atmosphere of a show or for an actor's morale. Uh, I might say. On the other hand, you know, the more voices you add, the the messier it gets, and so you have a potential for more conflict if you add more producers. But on the other hand, it can be a fruitful conflict, and I think in this case, it certainly will be that uh, Sam and Katrina will have a a stronger voice in you know who their characters actually are. As you probably have noticed as the shows go through, you will see episodes where one or the other or some other character seems to vary from from one episode to the other you know in what their innate characteristics are how they would act uh, or you know how large a role they might play in this particular situation what their attitude might be you know are they taking the lead are they hanging back you know is one of them you know more dominant than the other that sort of stuff and you know uh, they should have a voice in that uh, these people uh, Katrina and uh, Sam have live these characters for five years now. They know them better than anyone. So they certainly earned the right to, you know, declare, you know, he wouldn't do this. <laughs> no, certainly do that in that circumstance. Yeah, that sort of thing. Speaking about character, there's been a lot of talk about Roger and his characterization in the show versus the book. And while I think we can all agree that Rick Rankin, he knocked this out of the ballpark. He was superb this season. I'd like he to sure know, did. Yeah. right? Yeah. I yeah, wanted, he was great. <laughs> what parts of Roger in the show did you feel like were different than the Roger that you created in the books? Mm, well, it would be more in the early parts of Roger and Brianna's courtship, and that's largely a result of the constraints in time and space, in that a lot of uh, his speeches and so forth were directly from the book, but the context that made those work was not <laughs> in the show, because they had to cut it so so tightly that he would just be making these speeches that would make him seem, you know, abrupt or rude or uncaring or, you know, too, uh, too forceful or whatever, whereas if you read it in the book, you would not think that at all because 
both of you would have more time to let the situation unfold, and also you would be privy to Roger's thoughts, which you're not in the show. And so if it's something that depends a lot on what the character is feeling, then you know you, you really need to adjust the dialogue in some way that reflects that rather than take it straight from the book without the interior monologue that makes it make sense. One of the things that I feel like the show did, it had Roger leave Brianna the way that he did and I always felt like as a married man I, I could the night of their, their hand the, the fasting, the hand fasting. Okay. and there was a lot of controversy about that especially for me because I'm a married man I, I feel like I would never ever ever leave my wife especially the night that we uh, had, yeah. were just married <laughs> yes, exactly um, so <laughs> yeah. you know like it was the, I, I would just like to kind of get your thoughts on this and what in and, and, and kind of like Help some of the fans along and say, no, no, Roger is not that kind of guy. The show watcher only fans. Yeah, right. I, I, would, I would love your reassurance yeah. on this. Yeah, no, he's definitely not that kind of guy. You know, in the book, there is this big fight about whether he knew about the uh, the, the obituary notice or not. And, you know, the obituary notice is handled somewhat differently in the show than it was in the book to start with. But uh, And so the revelation is a little more abrupt in the show. But anyway, uh, what happens is is the same. That is, Brianna is yeah, utterly furious that he knew about this and he didn't tell her. And, you know, and she does, in fact, you know, you know shout at him and say, go, leave, you know. Whereas uh, in, the, uh, in the show, they said, uh, sort of had it, well, I'll go if you want me to. Well, you know, I don't really care, you know, sort of thing. Uh, and it was a little more clear cut in the book that, you know, that she actually said, you know, get out of here, I want to see you. <laughs> and, you know, and so he leaves, but it's fairly clear in the book that he leaves only temporarily, you know, in order to let her cool off and also to uh, go and see if he can find some gemstones to, uh, to assist their return to the future, which is what he thinks that they probably want to do. Uh, and then, of course, he does come back, you know, searching for her. And that dif- is different in the show as well, but that's because of the uh, the time constraints. That's why they had him, you know, uh, forced onto the ship and dragged off and so forth rather than than the way that it happened in the book, which is uh, allowed to um, spool at a at a more leisurely pace where you can actually see what people mean. And you're also privy, as I say, to their inner thoughts, which you're not in the show. You're getting everything from the expression on the actor's face and the, and the dialogue. And, you know, that's a very powerful and compelling thing, but it's limited. Mm-hmm. Well, another person who had a phenomenal season was Sophie Skelton in Asbury. Mm-hmm. And, I thought she did a great job. Right? She was outstanding. Um, so mm-hmm. one of the really interesting things that ended up happening, though, is a lot of non-book readers reacted to the chemistry between David Barry and Sophie Skelton as Lord John Gray and Brie. Um, and they, some people even said they'd prefer to see Brie with Lord John as a couple because of how they felt about she and Roger. Did you get to hear They're any aware of this? That he's gay. Yeah, right. right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, well, not happening, you know. But the friendship between them is genuine, and and that one is is done pretty much straight by the book, mm-hmm. as including the dialogue. <laughs> the person that kind of is the um, progenitor of all this controversy, and the reason why it all kind of happened was Stephen Bonnet uh, mm-hmm. and for for most of these characters, and it was a great reveal uh-huh. at the end of the season that it was kind of him who just put everybody into motion and absolutely terrified everybody. And what I would like to... Well, a good villain will do that. I know. And and, and speaking of great villains, uh, who (laughs) scares you more? Ed Spilliers as Stephen Bonnet or Tobias Menzies as Black Jack Randall? Well, neither of them scare me. I find them both very fascinating because they are, in fact, (laughs) just facets of me. (laughs) But as for the uh, the outside world, um, hmm. I don't know. Probably uh, Stephen Bonnet is a little more dangerous to the general populace because he uh, it's not evident what he is to begin with. He is actually a sociopath, which means that while he doesn't perceive other people's emotions or interests as being of any importance to him, he at least recognizes that they exist and therefore act like a normal person, you know, as long as, uh, as your interests run with his. Uh, there's a spot in the book where someone who knows him, telling you know, Jamie or Claire or Roger, says, you know, uh, as long as your interests run with his, you know, you're in schools, the minute they don't, you're lying on your back in the sawdust with blood in your eyes. <laughs> and and uh, you know, that's it. You know, it's only his interests that are important to him. Um, on the other hand, his interests are really not that um uh, they're not unusual, you might say. Uh, I should say he's not a pervert, basically, is what it is. Uh, John Randall actually is. He is a very uh, 
dedicated uh, sadist. Uh, he's a uh, you know bisexual to a certain degree. It appears that he uh, prefers men, but you'll notice that he attacks both Claire and Jenny, and he doesn't succeed in neo raping or torturing them. Only because in Claire's case she was rescued by Jamie. In Jenny's case, because she, uh, for lack of anything else to do, laughed at him, which you know unmanned him temporarily and caused him to leave in some discomfiture. But uh, but he would have had either of them yielded or acted you know terrified or not been rescued in time. Uh, as it is, given his position as a garrison commander, he had pretty much complete control over the prisoners, all of whom were male. You know, so nothing easier than to get one of them aside in a in a dungeon and do whatever he liked to them. So no, he's not homosexual. He, but uh, you know, he is a sadist. He just likes to take people apart. Uh, consequently, he's not that much of a threat to the general populace, but he sure is to the uh, person that he has his eye on. Well, we're going to turn from your your fictional villains and people, you know, not doing <laughs> doing right and kind of turn it into the real life of people who um, kind of be, became quite loud in the interwebs about their criticism and negativity and, and kind of were a bit... Um, or rude, little, yeah, picky. rude, yeah. And to me, as as an Outlander fan, I'm I'm. Uh, in case you can't tell, Diana, I'm an eternal optimist. <laughs> I'm a very <laughs> joyous person. But there were some people who, you know, they just wanted to nitpick the wigs, Myrta living, the pace of the seasons. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I didn't know how that made you feel that people are so wedded to these books that they um, really kind of were loud about their sadness about how things happened on the show. Uh, well, I mean, on the one hand, I'm thrilled that they uh, <laughs> that they live in the books, so to speak, and appreciate them for what they are. But, you know, speaking personally, I'm perfectly capable of separating books from show. And, you know, I can appreciate the show's differences. And, you know, even if they do things that I occasionally don't like, I understand why they did it. And I say, yeah, I can see why that's, that's it. You know, I wish we had enough room to do this. But, you know, the way you did it is good. You know, uh, like the, the bear, which, of course, aroused a lot of controversy and so forth, because everybody had been looking forward to seeing a bear and seeing Clara hit Jamie in the face with a fish while fighting a bear and so forth. And, you know, I knew going in from this that there was no conceivable way that they were going to be able to do a convincing bear fight. I mean, not only are there no bears in Scotland, which means that you would have to import a trained bear at huge expense and difficult quarantines and things like that, but also um, to make a trained bear fight convincingly while keeping your actor or his stunt double from actually being injured, this is probably not on. You know, they uh, they couldn't do the grotto scene in in season one because, as Ron told me, he said you would have no idea of the insurance issues when you put <laughs> actors in hot water. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I can just see what their insurance issues would be like if they said, well, now you're going to do this scene with a live bear who is going to pretend to eat you. <laughs> so, you know, I knew that going in, that that was not going to work. So I was actually fairly pleased with what Tony came up with as, a, as an alternative. Uh, but their book readers weren't because they were wanting to see that scene particularly and you know that's you know that's just the way it is that's if that's what you want to see that's what you want to see but the reality is that's not what you're going to see because they can't do it I liked the little nod though of Claire with the fish it reminded me of season one when she was walking um and instead of having you know the wolf fight we heard a wolf howl and I thought mm-hmm. okay that's just their mm-hmm. their little nod like okay book readers yeah, we know you're going like, to miss yes, this we know you want to see that we can't do it but we, we understand yeah. yeah yeah that's constantly kind of going on in the background and yeah i appreciate it i hope the fans do yes yes (laughs) in terms of season four is the bear fight your favorite change from the books oh no i can't say that i liked it particularly i just understand why they did it (laughs) which which change from the books do you think uh that they that they made you understood you said okay that makes sense i really i really actually i kind of like this change in comparison to what i wrote in the book Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a few things. I can't kind of bring anything specifically to mind at the moment. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not, <laughs> no, <laughs> not no problem. picking no up way. anything. Yeah. It wasn't anything large. You know, just passing moments and so forth. What do you feel actually is the biggest challenge the writers have in adapting your books? Just the 
size. You know, mm-hmm. these are really big books. They're very complex and they're very tightly structured. You might not realize that looking at one of them, but they are. Almost every scene in a book is there for a specific reason. If you pull that out, then it's going to affect all kinds of different things throughout the book mm-hmm. and possibly in other books as well, uh, which means that you've got to be very careful in picking and choosing and, you know, which scenes do we have to have because either they're important in telling the story, what scenes do we have to have because the fans really, really want to see them, which fans do we, which scenes do we have to make up in order to you know, support these scenes and make this a coherent episode. And, uh, you know, it's a very, very convoluted and complicated business. And as I say, it's a very collaborative business as well. In terms of the business of, of making television and and putting it out to the to all of us uh to all of us Outlander fans and Outlander nerds, uh, there is actually kind of some big news that just happened. Uh, that would be Chris Albrecht stepping down as CEO of Stars. Oh, and, I hadn't heard that. Oh, I was just going to ask you: Has this affected you in any particular way? And and what do you think well, that not actually? Yet. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> but now that I've broken the news to you, you can, you can thank me later. Um, what what do you think that means for the future of Outlander beyond season six? Well, I don't know. Um, I mean, I truly don't know. Basically, it only depends on the show. If the show is doing really well as we get into season five, then great. You know, if it's doing really, really well as we get into season six, then we're probably good for another season after that. But, you know, who knows? It will depend on all kinds of things. Television, as you undoubtedly know, is kind of flaky. <laughs> and uh, things happen. Uh, sometimes a project will collapse if the person who initiated it leaves, even though the project itself is capable of running under its own steam. If it doesn't have that one person you know, pushing behind it, you know, it, there's a lot of other people who want to push their projects in instead, and they can do that. So, you know, we just don't know. I will tell you, though, that uh, the programming head of STARS is... Uh, uh, very much in favor of uh, of Outlander, and so I think that they will probably continue to support it. So we would be remiss if we didn't ask you about your future books. I'm not going to ask you if you're done, I, and I'm not going to ask you when the when the last book is coming out because, frankly, that's up to you. And 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 I'm just going to go by with whatever you say. But you're all, mm-hmm. my question for you is: you're almost thirty years into living with these characters. I mean, that's that's mm-hmm. pretty rare. I mean, like I feel like only George R. R. Martin, I feel like, has done that, uh, or maybe even Tolkien, and that's probably about it. Mm-hmm. Do you ever? Yeah, George is far behind me. Start <laughs> until 1996. My first book was published in 91. Well, that, that's that's why you're much better than he is. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> but we won't say that. Uh, like, it, it's okay. I will say it for you. It's it's, it's fine. Um, <laughs> do you think you'll actually ever be done with this universe? Um, like. As in, like the story will be completely told. I mean, like we know you're going to end the book with with book ten, and we know that you have written side books and novellas. But is book mm-hmm. ten really it, or is there really a character that's pulling you now? Um, you know, for like a for like a new a kind of spin off in some kind of way. Yeah. Do you feel like you know you? I know that you've had the plan, but. Do you feel like when you're no, able to? No, it's not a plan. I have no idea where I'm going usually. It's just, you know, from what I, from what I have done, I can see a certain distance to the future, and that's why I think there are ten books. Um, besides, my publisher was pressuring me to tell them how many I thought there were, and you know, I'm uh, I'm 67. I don't know how long I'm going to live. Luckily, I come from a fairly long-lived family, so I have a good chance of making it into my 90s. And if so, you know, then I got more time. But you just never know. Um, my mother died at 40, and so you know, you 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 make the most you can of the days that you have mm-hmm. so you, you don't know if book 10 is going to be the end of it at all or you just saying you yeah. just kind of oh well no it's not i mean there's a prequel about jamie fraser's parents <laughs> amongst other things but uh there are also should i live long enough um one two or possibly three books about master raymond I know who he is and where he came from, and while his world is, uh, it overlaps the Outlander world only briefly in different spots, uh, he's an interesting character. <laughs> Diana, if you could just do me a favor and just take mm-hmm. your take your vitamins, okay? <laughs> take your vitamins so you can keep yeah, writing. We'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> just just so you can keep writing, and we can keep on getting these stories. I, I'd be I'd be heartbroken if we could if we couldn't keep getting more. <laughs> well, we'll do our best here. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that is it. That is it, my friend. You you survived the interview. Thank you very, very much. Well, it's my pleasure entirely, Blake. Thanks, and Mary. Diana Gabaldon, ladies and gentlemen. Whew.
I love this. Wasn't that great? Just so great. Just to be able to be like, how did you feel about this? I can't can't believe I just told Diana Gabaldon to take her vitamins. Uh, You know? (laughs) Vitamins are a good thing. Diana, do me a favor. Take your vitamins. Of course you would. (laughs) Of course you would, you little goober. (laughs) Hey, listen, I want to get to the end of the series. I want to make sure that everything gets written. Well, you're going to have to start reading, my friend. Uh, That's true. Well, hey, another reason to join OutlanderCastClan.com so you can read Blake's book club. Read Blake's book club. Well, you can you can well you can listen, listen to, to it. it. You know Does what this I mean. Mean that you're reading another book? <sighs> maybe, perhaps. The we'll answer see. is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. The answer may oh be yes. Oh my gosh! The answer <laughs> is yes. Yes. Awesome. Well, in addition to that, of course, we're going to be keeping you up to date with fun things throughout Droughtlander. We're going to be chatting a more recap about season four. Bringing in some of our most beloved and generous Outlander cast clan members throughout Dratlander so that they can give us their opinions on season four as well. And we're just going to keep bringing you tons of content. So if you haven't been to OutlanderCast.com, you're going to want to check it out because our team, that's right, we have a team, a team of people from across the globe. We're going to be bringing you fresh content every single week of Dratlander. I don't know anybody else that can say that. We did it last Droughtlander. We're going to be doing it again. So whether it's a new podcast episode or a new blog post from our amazing bloggers, you are going to want to make sure that you check out OutlanderCast. Maybe it's like your 2 p.m. thing on Thursdays. You just remind yourself. (laughs) You just say, hey, Siri, remind me on Thursdays at 2 p.m. to go to OutlanderCast.com. Because you know how 2 p.m. on Thursdays, it kind of stinks. You're like, gosh, there's one more day. One more day. I need a coffee. You can have your coffee with us. Oh, coffee with Outlander cast. Hey, we got you. Branding, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, my darling, would you care to close this bad boy out? I would love to. All right, let's get it done. Thank all of our patrons who make this possible. Seriously, without you guys, Outlander Cast would have a little bit rockier of a road to get going. So <laughs> thank you all for being members of Outlander Cast Clan. We want to thank our most generous patrons, our associate producers, Angie, Carolyn, Celine, Cheryl, Dawn, Diane, Heather, Jeffrey, Jennifer, Larissa, Lauren, Linda, Marilyn, Mary, Michelle, Patricia, Sav- Shoot. Siobhan. <laughs> She's out of practice, ladies and gentlemen. I am. And there's somebody else, Summer and Valerie. Valerie's new on this level. It threw me off. Guys, I am Ron Burgundy. When I see things, I'm like, this is new. Um, Barbara, Carolyn, Christina. These people, sorry, are co-producers. Barbara, Carolyn, Christina. I am out of practice. Dana, Dieta, Janet, Jenny, Kathy, Keelan, Lisa, Liz, Marianne, Meredith, Raynal, Rita, Sharon, Sue, Tarantina, and then our executive producers, Ann, Bobby, Jen, Katie, Kirsty, Martha, Nadja, Peg, and Sarah. Thank you guys so much. You rock our socks. You guys make it all happen. And another thing that somebody that isn't part of OutlanderCastClan.com, what they can do to help make things happen for all of us here at OutlanderCast is actually tell a friend. Just just to tell a friend that uh, we exist, that the show Outlander exists. And apparently you listened to an episode where some jabroni in his basement told the author of uh, Outlander to take her vitamins so she could read the rest of, so she can write the rest of the series. (laughs) Be like, hey, this guy said this. Check this episode out. Out. She actually said some really great things um, about the, the show running and the, the behind the scenes of it all. Tell a friend that this episode happened. That's way how that's that's the way podcasts are disseminated through word of mouth, and that's the best way I think anybody can do that. So tell someone we exist. I agree. I agree. Maybe maybe you can do some a little cray cray. You ready for this? What's that? Screenshot your phone. And share it in your Instagram stories Ooh, or your job. Facebook stories just to show people like, hey, this is a new podcast that I'm listening to, especially during Droughtlander. People are looking for this kind of stuff all the time. So help out a fellow Sassanok and let them know. Well, we want to thank all of you who have taken the time to write a review in your podcast app of choice. This one, uh, shout out goes to Shelby's mama who says, I really enjoy this podcast. I like to hear about what other people notice about the episodes. Uh, um, I do not as I'm on the story and often 
sometimes miss some sim- smaller details. Oh. I really like Blake's technical observations. Keep up the w- good work, Blake uh, and Mary. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Shelby's mama. And if you like actually what we keep doing here on Outlander Cast, you want more of Mary and Blake, do check out maryandblake.com where we have all of our podcasts and all of our blogs that we do uh, as part of Mary and Blake Media, including This Is Us 2. It's a show about This Is Us on NBC, which is actually happening right now. So if you need more of Mary and Blake in your life, and really, honestly, who doesn't need more of Mary and Blake in their life? <laughs> Go to MaryandBlake.com, check out This Is Us Too and all the other stuff that we've done over over the ages. That's right. Well, <laughs> on that note, thank you so much for taking your time to listen to this episode. We'll talk to you guys soon. We're going to keep you comedy in Droughtlander. Dinner fash. My name's Mary. My name's Blake. And you've been listening to Outlander Cast. Outlander Cast.